Uh, I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. Siege, uh, a report has come down the wire just about a couple minutes before we started recording today. Uh, a uh, radio show out in Arizona, the Burns and Gambo show, putting out a report saying that uh, Arizona Coyotes owner Alex Morello is seeking out potential buyers for the Arizona Coyotes. Remember, this is a team that uh, is still looking to find some land to pitch their new arena. And we all know about how Mullet Arena is. Have you heard about this report? What can you tell us about the Arizona Coyotes situation as it stands right now? Well, what I can tell you is that officially the team still says that Alex Morello is only focused on winning the land auction for the parcel of land that where he wants to build a new arena. He wants to keep a team there. But, you know, I'm looking at the calendar, Julian, and it's April 4th. Mm-hmm. And we don't know where the Coyotes are going to play next season. Like, I think I'm comfortable going that far. And this is it, – it's it's like the slowest game. I mean – I know you hate when I reference my beard or the gray or my age, but I literally was. I don't hate that. Why do you think I hate but that I stuff? I think it's just. I was a young man. I was there <laughs> in the courtroom. Do you want to know a funny story? The f- I would love to know a funny story. The first time I ever remember kind of going viral on Twitter was when I was mm. tweeting from the court at at the uh, the bankruptcy hearings. Was that 2011? Anyway, I was I, I wouldn't remember the year specifically, but that sounds like a like the OG Twitter. But post. I was new on Twitter. I remember I had a BlackBerry that the Canadian press had issued me, and I used to get literally I'd get an email when any new follower followed me. And I just like would tweet what like it wasn't like I was you know, but I was able to bring people into a courtroom they couldn't otherwise be in, and it was a story of mm-hmm. of high kind of interest around the hockey world. And I just remember my BlackBerry going like <laughs> <laughs> and I got like, like, I'm not kidding, like thousands of fall. I, I had like 100 followers and, and got to like 10,000 in a couple days. Like it was like crazy. Um, and I was, you know, anyway, this is this is CJ <laughs> telling stories from the past. But like, that's where I remember, like, that's how long this has been going on for in various ways. That's a couple owners ago for the Coyotes. They obviously ended mm-hmm. up staying. They didn't end up moving to Hamilton at that time through bankruptcy court proceedings. Here we are in the year 2024. There's, you know, a couple weeks left in the Coyote season, and it finally feels, quite honestly, like this is getting to sort of decision day. And so I can't refute the report, but I also can't substantiate it. I don't have any additional information. But it, it, it wouldn't surprise me if the owner of the team was out there looking for other options, because let's remember, he's in a land auction. So... Anyone who's ever bid on a house, you know, you might like the house. You might have toured it. You might think, hey, I could see this is where I would hang out. This is, you know, where I'd watch games and this is this would be perfect for the kids. And this is where, you know, this is where the workout area, whatever. But you still got to win that. You still got to buy the house like and, and other people see the same things you see. There's it's no guarantee at all that the Coyotes win this land auction. And it's, there's no guarantee. I think that the NHL is is willing to continue on forever more at mullet arena. And so I still, I don't, I wish I could bring more info for our 100 percenters out there, but this is notable. You know, there's a lot of stuff swirling about the coyotes. I mean, you got that sense, you know, even at the jams meeting last month, we were in Florida. Like it just feels like something is up, but I don't, you know, we can't go any farther than that. Like I have no tangible information. I'm not saying they're leaving. But it, I think, you know, Bill Daly gave a quote that I remember quite well when we were in Palm Beach there in late March, and it was like, it's getting late. Like, it's they, – they, they have to have a plan or no plan at all. Um, and, you know, I'm going to put my usual caveats in here. Arizona will be the number one destination for expansion if this team is moved. It's not unlike Minnesota was way back in the day, right? There was all kinds of problems. The, the original Minnesota North Stars moved to Dallas. They got, you know, proper circumstances, right? They built an arena where the, the Wild now play. St. Paul, is. it's been a great place for the NHL. Like, I think that that's, that could be the model if it gets that far. Obviously, Alex Morello 
doesn't want that to happen. He owns the team, but if this report's correct, he's out there looking for other buyers. And so the Coyotes, uh, they're going to be a, a popular topic around these parts. I think the next few months, Julian. So, so I, I want to touch on one point you made about how this might not be long for, for mullet arena. If, if the Arizona Coyotes are not going to be there, where are they going to go? This is the hardest part. Like no one debates, like the players love playing there in Arizona. They love living in Arizona. Uh, great weather, great taxes, good lifestyle. Check, 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 check. It's, it's not an NHL arena. Right. And I think it was cute for a little while and it's cozy. And obviously there, there, there are some, there are some positives. Like there's, there can be energy in there. Like I get it, but like, from what I understand, like the players got to like walk through a tent it's like raining yep. sometimes. Like, like it sounds weird, but it's just, you know, you get you make it to the National Hockey League. There's a, there's a certain level of, it's actually in the CBA. I don't know if you're aware of this, but like what visiting teams even have to have available to them in, in the NHL in terms of workout equipment, like what that looks like. It's spelled out. Like the point is, there's literally, I think there's a, a line about towels, like for visiting teams in the CBA. My point is, is like the the standard of what's expected for the workplace is spelled out in the CBA. I'm not saying they're, they're quite, they're not meeting it in Arizona, but obviously it's not, it's not national league. Like it's not the way if you're a member of the New York Rangers and you walk into Madison square garden, what you're getting or, or, you know, any number of yeah. teams that, that go above and beyond. Um, and it's not because the funny part is it's not because the organization doesn't want it. Like that's, that's actually where I think the story may be like one aspect that gets missed Julian is that, the team itself wants to have a real rink, right? Like they went through a lengthy process in Tempe last year where they had a referendum, but they, they had plans to build an arena. They had a parcel of land and I saw the plans for that. It was going to be spectacular if they could pull it off, but you know, there was a local referendum and it got voted down. They didn't get a chance to build there. And so I guess the question becomes how long can the league wait for one of these plans to hit? Uh, because I, I do believe in a strange way, as much as this might seem adversarial, the way we're talking about it, like Alex Morello knows he can't play in Mullet Arena forever. The NHL knows that. Obviously, Marty Walsh, if you remember his comments back at the All-Star game, he knows that. The players themselves are oh, yeah. frustrated. I just think it, it could get to a circumstance here where, you know, it's just going to take too long to get what they want or there's too many roadblocks. I mean, unfortunately, you don't build an arena overnight. And so, I you know it's kind of the best way I can say it is, is that I don't think a decision's made. I do think there's a world they're back in Arizona next year. Like I, I really want to be clear about that, but it's not the fact that it's not for sure. That's where the news is. Like that's, that's where the buzz is right now is that we can't say with definitive confidence that, you know, the coyotes are going to play a game in Mullet arena next October. And so in, until that gets settled one way or another, until someone comes out and says, here's the plan, or they got this land auction, they're going to build the arena They're You know, like we need, we need concrete information. There's no concrete information. And so in the absence of that, you get these kind of reports and look, it's, it's not, it would only make sense if you're Alex Morello, that you're at least seeing what you might get for the team. Like, like I have no reason to refute the report. I just, as I say, I can't, I can't add on, or I don't have any new knowledge at this time. Okay, well, we will add to what we've already discussed with the Arizona Coyotes when it comes time, because this is definitely going to be a situation we will revisit as more information. Frustration is growing there, man, though. Oh, I bet. I bet there is. You know, I don't want to say too much here, but I, I really think the players that have had to play there this season, it's been a strain. And, you know, that can't continue on forever. If you're an NHL player, like it's owners can think in decades, players got to think in years, right? Like, like ideally, if you're a successful owner of a team, you own a team for a long, long time. I think of Ed Snyder in Philadelphia, uh, like he owned that team based, you know, his entire adult life until he died. Rest in peace, Ed Snyder. But like owners can think long term. Players get six, seven year careers. Some of them, of course, get shorter than that. I think if you're there and you're like, first of all, there's all these rumors and then it's it's just a hard way to make your your living, and I actually think they had a really long losing streak that I, I think can be tied to some of what what went on. I mean, and obviously they weren't a team that any of us were picking to win the Stanley Cup, but it's been a, it's been a very difficult season for the Coyotes, and and I do think there has to be some kind of pl- like firm plan, like not just let's wait and see, wait and see, wait. And see. You know, it's there there has to be some firm planning here, or 
you know, we're talking about this team playing somewhere else. Okay. And with that, it's time for Leafs Corner. You ready for oh, an soon. exciting edition of the... Yeah, I know. Usually, I mean, we don't really have a set place for Leafs Corner. It's just kind of when it comes time for us to talk about the Leafs, the corners there. I wanted to bring up Austin Matthews. He scored goal number 63 against the Tampa Bay Lightning on Wednesday. Seven away from uh, the big 70 number. How realistic is it for Austin Matthews to reach that plateau, you think? I remember when I was first asked about this, like it was it was when he was at like 25 or 30. Like people started saying, oh, he's on pace for 72 or whatever it was. And I was like, well, that I mean, that's all well and great. You know, sometimes players get to get off to hot starts or slow starts. And then, you know, things usually normalize. So I thought 70 was a preposterous talk. Quite honestly, probably until the last few weeks. And and what I see in Austin Matthews is someone who understands, like he, let's call it as, like as great a goal scorer as he is, like he may never get any chance like this again. I think he he is hunting the puck. Yeah. I, I think it's very doable, quite honestly. I, you know, for the players on the team, like they've started to talk about, I've been around the, the dressing room a bit the last week or so here. If the other players are talking about wanting to feed him the puck. I think it can be something to rally a team around. And so I wouldn't rule it out uh, for, for Matthews. I mean, certainly scoring seven go- goals in seven games for him is nothing. I'm not saying it's easy. It's, it's certainly not automatic, but it's it's not. You're not asking him now to get 12 in the last seven games. Like that would be where I'd be like, eh, okay, it's possible, but he, he's got to explode. Like I, I think with where the team is at and where he's at. It's very possible. You know, they have two back-to-backs left in the season though. And so one thing that's, I'm just, I don't know how they're going to navigate. Does he play all the games? Is this something that matters enough to have him play the games? Like, like I think there's a real debate to be had there. I don't think it's being had yet. I should be very clear on that, Julian, that Mm -hmm. my understanding is everyone's just going to let this breathe. Like let him play the next few games, see where he's at. If he keeps getting one or two a game and, He's he's in that mix that maybe there's a decision to be made right at the end of the season, but I, I think he can do it, and I think he wants to do it. Like that's that's the key. Like we can all we all sit in our living rooms and our do these podcasts, and like we, we're we're doing the numbers, but like I think different milestones matter less to the player maybe than they might to the fan. But seventy goals is, dude. Like, the, I mean, look at he's at sixty three, right? So yes, even if he gets to 67, that's a significant number, but 70, there's just something big and round about that number. And it's really only been touched by the absolute greats. And then, you know, someone like Bernie Nichols, who's a very, very good player too in his day, but in the eighties when scoring was, but like, it's like, it's preposterous that, that it's even possible with the last, you know, two weeks of the season here. And so I'm, I'm fascinated both by kind of the chase, like how he performs in the games and he's generating a ton of shots. I was at the game against Tampa on Wednesday. Like he only got the one goal, the the only goal that he scored on the night, but he was, he had a shooter's mind that night. If you're, if you, you know, the beauty of being able to watch him from the press box is you like, he had a stick up ready to shoot at, at every moment. And, you know, I think that's how it should be quite honestly. I think back in the day, probably when players got to those numbers, that was what happened. And, and, it's a long season. I've had I've had two or three random people not connected where I didn't initiate the conversation in the last few weeks say to me, like, why is the season not shorter? Um I mean, we had a whole discussion about that. I know, but it day. keeps coming up. Like, seriously, like I keep hearing it. And I, I promise you, it's not a case. I'm not writing a story about it. I'm not going around going, like, hey, is the season too long? It's like it feels like I don't know what's going on. It's like the hive mind of the hockey world. Everyone feels like the season's too long, but this is, I mean, something like this is something to focus on, especially if you're in this market, um, as the season gets to this stage, right? So I, I think he can do it, and I think he's going to chase it hard. I, I, who knows? I, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure how it's all going to bounce, and, and it'll be fascinating when it comes time. If he's at 68 and they, 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 they end the season on back to back games, like, does he get both games? I don't like that. That's that would be. Could you imagine the storyline if dude was at like 68? And so, so to review the schedule here, they have the Canadians, the Penguins, the Devils twice, uh, then the Red Wings, then the Florida trip at the end where they're in Florida, then in Tampa Bay on the 16th and the 17th. Could you imagine a scenario? Austin Matthews, 68 goals, 
skips one of the two games of the back-to-back just because the team wants him to be ready for the playoffs and to just kind of keep him away from being injured. Could you imagine the storyline? I can imagine it because they've done it the last few years. Like, that's that's a thing. Like, we have the same coach. Obviously, it's a new GM in Bradshaw Living. But and if you look at the last couple of years, the, two years ago when Matthews hit 60, he hit 60 and they sat him the next night. He had, it was the last game of the season. Um, And so... I guess what I don't know is if he didn't hit 60 in the second last game of the season, would they have played him the last game? I'm guessing they would have, but that's that's a hard thing. I remember Mitch Marner sat out last year. He's at 97 points, and, and he sat out. And, and look, I think it's a real debate because I'm here for all sides of it, right? I mean, I was at a game on Monday night. Carter Verhage got injured for Florida. It doesn't sound like it's a serious, serious injury, but he's probably out to the playoffs. So like that's the downside. Like the Panthers really aren't. I mean, you know, it's it's not been going in their direction lately. But like you you lose key players, to injuries that could you know cause future issues and in, in games that don't truly matter in a big way. And, and then you can say, well, what do these milestones matter? If if obviously if a team like the Leafs went on to win a cup, I don't think anyone would remember what the final goal or point total was of anybody. They probably just talked about the team that won the cup. But you know, this seventy is. It's different. It's it's sort of like I think of McDavid's 100 assists. He's just so much closer. I don't I don't see a lot of built in tension there. I think he's just going to get it. Matter of course, and if the Oilers want to sit him at you know one or more of the last few games, it's not that big a deal. But I, you know, it's it's a tough call. I, obviously, the playoffs are what matters, but you also make these guys play the whole regular season. Like Austin Matthews missed one game this season so far with an illness. Um, you know, he's been healthy all year. Like for a player like that, he's cause he has had injuries through his career, right? Like maybe one of the reasons his, his goal totals weren't a little higher at times. I mean, he had a pandemic wiped out one sure 50 goal season, um, in 2019, 20, and you know, some injuries impacted the rest. I think that was a big, big sort of point with him scoring 40 last year, but he just may never get all these circumstances at play again. So I don't know how they're going to navigate it. As I say, like my understanding is no one's talking about it yet. Like, I don't think there, there's no negotiations here. There's no, this isn't controversial at this point. I think it's just more like, Hey, let's play the next three or four games, see where we're at. But it, it will be an interesting call. If you know, let's, let's get ahead of the story before it's a story. If they get to the last week of the regular season and he's at 68 going into a Tuesday, Wednesday games against Florida and Tampa back to back, like how they handle that will be, fascinating because probably at that point the playoff position will be settled one way or another maybe not but but probably and it's like do you send him out there trying to do something personal when i don't know it's it's a tough call but i I think you you rely on what the player tells you too that that, that'll be probably the that's got to be part of it like you got the sports science crew you got the coach's opinion the gm's opinion but i think when you're talking about a franchise player with a chance to do something that like it might not, not happen for 30 years it's been 30 years since we've seen a 30, 70 goal score. Like it could like it, it, it's it, that would be insane for at least in my, in my lifetime. I don't know if I've ever seen that. No. And, and if you were alive, it's you were, you weren't watching Mario Lemieux do it or whatever. Like you, you might've been physically alive, but you, you weren't aware of it. And so, exactly. you know, I think you let the players go for it. Like I, I, I do think that there's like a little bit too much overemphasis on load management at times, like if you're not going to do it through the season, like if you've had them already play 10 back to backs or whatever the team's played, like, are you really telling me you can't do one more? And, you know, let's keep in mind the leaf season ends on a Wednesday. The earliest they open the playoffs is a Saturday. They, they probably, they, I mean, at this point it looks like they're going to play Florida. They're going to be in the state of Florida. So there's not even really travel involved. Like there's, there's a couple of days of rest there. I don't know. Seeing the way he celebrated 62 is in my mind. Because Austin Matthews, for like, if you watch his career, the guy does not really celebrate goals. Like, he expects to score. It's kind of his vibe. But he celebrated 60 like crazy. And, like, I just feel like it weirdly could be a galvanizing thing as you go into these games where you're like, well, what really matters here? Um, I don't know. I, I'm a hockey historian a little bit. I think it matters. Like, I want to see McDavid chase 100 assists. Like, I want to... I want to see this stuff. Like you, you might be like, yeah, it's only numbers and it gets lost to time, but like, no, it's not just numbers. That's history. It's fun. And that, that leads into another question I want to ask you. And I think you're, you're, you're on the track of what I'm thinking of here. Like as media people, when we're in the press box and we're watching games, there's like an air of professionalism that we're supposed to carry ourselves where we're in those spaces. But like, 
when we're watching history, like I'm very curious, like how I'm not saying you're going to be in a, in, a, in a press box, like waving your arms, like, oh, my God, it happened. But like, I think you're allowed to be like, oh, this is cool. Like, we're allowed to look at this stuff and say this is cool. Like, I, I'd love to know how you're you're tracking all of this and how excited you are about seeing these guys get close to these numbers. Yeah. Like for me, it's funny. It's not the obvious way. Like I wouldn't go to a game like cheering for him or even another player, whatever it is to hit that milestone. Like it's not that, but I can think of numerous things. Like when you even just ask this question off the top of my head where I've been in a press box and something has happened and I'm like, whoa, like it's almost like something you don't expect. I'm like, that's part of this. Yeah. Cause like the hilarious thing, like I'm saying like it could be 68. It could be 66 going into the last game, and he might score four. I'm not saying it's likely, but I can tell you for certain, back in 2016, I went to a game in Ottawa. It was Austin Matthews' first game. I'd already spilled tons of ink on him. You know, he's a first-round pick of the Maple Leafs. I'd written lots of stories. The last thing on earth I thought I was going to be watching or writing about that night was him scoring four goals in his NHL debut, and he did it by the second remission. And so... And it's not just him. Like, there's tons of stuff. Sidney Crosby scoring the golden goal. I mean, like, there's lots of yeah. moments. I remember that one LA New York Rangers uh, Cup final, 2014. The first overtime period of the deciding game, and that was insane. Like, I actually remember there were so many crazy chances both ways. And obviously, it mat like, it not only mattered because the Kings had a chance to win the cup, but if the Rangers won that and the Kings had to fly all the way across the continent at that point in time, I'm not sure LA wins another cup. LA was on fumes at that point. And I just remember that overtime was full of moments where I'm in the press box. And again, I have, there's no rooting interest. I'm just like, Whoa, like this sports are fun, man. Hockey's fun. This yeah. has been a fun season. I mean, as much as, you know, I've, I've talked a few times now and we've talked about it, Julian, about it being too long or whatever. Like, you know, we're, we're recording this at six o'clock. So you're probably not hearing this till Friday morning, I'm guessing, but on Thursday night, so it's, this isn't our usual time. There's a game in an hour here. It's, it's Pittsburgh and Washington. It's like the classic rivalry of the last 15 years, not the way we're used to it. Where one, only one, one of those teams is making the playoffs mathematically. And I'm excited for that game. And like, I'll be excited if, if there's a chance for, you know, if I happen to be in the building, I'm actually going to the Oilers last game of the regular season uh, against Arizona. Like, who knows? Oh, okay. I don't know where Connor McDavid will be at that point. I mean, the guy gets like four points a night just for fun. Like, it's like I brush my teeth. He gets four points. Um, but, <laughs> but like, maybe there'll be some history on the line that night. Like, I, you're doing mm -hmm. it wrong if you're in the press box and you can't still love the game. If you can't still get into a moment, into a record, into something significant, something that matters, something that people are going to remember. Remember where it all started. Like, what sports do you remember? Like, I was a kid. I remember like Joe what? Carter hitting that home run to win the World Series for the Blue Jays. I, you know, I could go through a list of things that, that people my age would relate to. But I still remember that in... in an older age now, like that was a long time ago. And the point is when you're a sports writer or personality, someone who's got to talk about the game, write about it, be on TV or YouTube or whatever the hell we're doing now for this industry, you got, you, you have to, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but it is, it's, it's multifaceted yeah. at this point. It's not, it it's is. not as easy to just say what we're all doing. We're all doing a little bit, of everything, but like you get to be a chance to be there and you still can't enjoy it. Like, again, you're not cheering for it. You're not wearing a Jersey. You're not with your buddies. You're not having a beer or eating a hot dog or whatever. Although I eat pizza in the press box at Scotiabank Arena. Yeah, you guys are lucky for that. Pizza, I, I pizza, do, I'll pizza. Say this, I'll say this. The best pizza pizza I have ever had is at Scotiabank Arena. There you go. It's the best pizza pizza I've ever had. But I'm just saying, if you can't get into all that stuff, then you you should get out of the business immediately. Because because then you're just punching the clock, right? Like, then you're doing any other job. And and. So yeah, I'm fired up for the end of the season. That's why I get fired up for the playoffs too. Like it's cause that's history. Like the, I love the stuff that matters. I think the, the, the longer I'm in the biz, bud, the, the harder sometimes it's like game 44 of a long season, like in January or whatever, like sometimes that becomes a little harder to get up for, but you know, I'm, I'm dialed in right now. So I'm excited to see what happens again, not just with Matthews, with, McDavid with with these last couple teams getting in the playoffs and then obviously who's going to raise the mug this year that's that's the history oh yeah
One other thing I want to mention, too, while we were trying to think of 70 goal scorers, I believe the last time that happened, uh, both Timo Solani and uh, Alexander McGillney reached the 70 goal threshold in 1992, 1993. So if Austin Matthews does this, he will be the first 70 goal scorer I have seen while living on this earth. Wow. Yep. I've never seen a 70 goal scorer uh, as long as I've been alive. That's crazy. Do you know what's funny? When you think back, there weren't even there haven't been that many 50 goal scorers, really. Like we started to see them yep. with increasing regularity here the last few years. And obviously Pasternak got to 60, McDavid got to 64, Matthews got to 60 and like two years ago. But like even hitting 50 goals was a big deal going back the last seven or eight years. 70s insane. I don't even know what it means. Yeah. I'm not here arguing for like he's got to be win the heart trophy or anything like that. But I'm just saying like 70 would be flat out insane if he got there. Like, and, and we forget too, like Connor McDavid hit 64 last year. Like if you're, if you're Austin Matthews and I would love to live in a world where like, there's a genuine rivalry between Austin Matthews and Connor. McDavid. I think they're buddies, but like that's, I think they're buddies and it's cool to be buddies, but it would be so cool if both of those guys, and I'm not saying they have to hate each other, but like both of those guys look at each other doing one thing and they actively go out of their way to try to one up the other. Like, this would be Austin saying, huh, you hit 64, I hit 70. Like, th- it would be cool that if might, that was, like, genuine bragging rights. That might be part of it now that he's this close. It's not just I, – I think yeah. it's McDavid at 64, but it's also Ovechkin at 65. Like, that is the yeah. modern number. Like, you know, we're not counting the, the what happened in 92-93 because, that you know, that was – it really was a different NHL. I mean, you weren't even walking among us, Julian. I can't even imagine. The world was a, a, not nearly as good a place as it is today because you weren't around. But I'm just saying, like, he's at 63. Like, you know he wants to get to 66. Like, I think that's the first number for him. Like, that's the bare minimum of how he wants to come out of these seven games. But I I, I don't know. I just, I get a feeling they're all pushing for set. Like, it's hilarious. The Leafs teammates are all bringing up 70 on their own. Like, and they were even before he got to 63. Like, he got to 60. I think it might have been Samson of after the game last Saturday in Buffalo. He said, like, hope I can get to 70. Like, he was already up in the ante, right? They're like... Uh, you know, I guess they've all watched the guy enough. I mean, he he can score a goal game for p- large periods of time. So, uh, but don't you want this if you're if you're a team that is already on a course to make the playoffs? This isn't just any and team, you need though. Any, I I understand that we're talking about the Toronto Maple Leafs, and we understand the expectations are different. I mean, more just in the vacuum where you have seven games left in the season, you're trying to get your guys as sharp as they can and give them some kind of carrot to dangle ahead of the playoffs, like. This is good, right? You want the guys to be motivated. They want to do this. Like, you'd rather that over them dragging their feet the last seven or eight games. I don't know. Well, and again, like, I haven't talked to Austin. So, like, I can't, I'm not speaking for him here. There's no code here. But it's like, I also think, it, how much does it really mean to him? I, I, I think that has to be the fundamental part of the conversation. Like, maybe he doesn't really, care. like, you know, again, we all get fired up. We're doing the math. I think he cares. I, I think, think he cares. He cares. As if I said, the celebration much, for 60 does. was legit. And then watching him play these last couple of games since, like he literally is ready to shoot at any moment, which again, it's not a bad strategy. He's like, he's scoring at a pace better than Ovechkin's first eight seasons in the league. Like it, it's, that's actually, I could argue it's a winning strategy for Toronto. If, if Matthews is scoring lots of goals and, and this team, I think is second or third in the league in, in win since January 1st, they're first in goals. Like a lot of things have been going right, even with their loss to Tampa this week. So I, I'm with you. I, th- I think you just go for it. Like from an organization, you're like, you live with the negative, like the potential consequence of an injury. Keep in mind, a player playing any game, some stupid game on a Tuesday in September, split squad in training camp that isn't even televised, players can be injured, right? And, and, and suffer significant injuries. Like there's a risk in the sport. It's inherent for every player who ever puts on their gear and goes out on the ice in, in that, that this level, I think you just live with the risk, but you know, again, look, man, there are millions of dollars at stake for the organization stuff. You and I are not even thinking about, we don't have to factor in. We can think about history books and good stories and the like, but uh, you know, look at the end of the day, it's it's going to be an interesting decision. I'm telling you, some because seven goals in seven games. It's I, you know, he could score. I get in, in four maybe, but I, I think it's likely going to go down to the wire. And 
we'll see how the Leafs handle it. As I say, okay, they're not. It's not decided just yet. I think I think it's an open conversation is the best way to phrase that. Okay, uh, to cap off uh, Leafs corner, uh, the Leafs signed uh, Jacob Quillen, uh, a NCAA free agent, to a two year entry level contract with an uh, AAV of eight seven five k beginning next season. Uh, one of the many college free agents signing in the last few days. What do you know about this uh, Jacob Quillen character? Well, you know, Quinnipiac won the national title last year in a yes, they did. overtime win over University of Minnesota. Quillen scored the overtime winning goal against Matthew Nyes at the time, playing for University of Minnesota. So there are some leaf ties there. I think, you know, he was pretty well sought after. What what made him come to Toronto, of all things, I think Brendan Shanahan and Brad Trilliving were both quite involved in the recruitment here. And I think that that, you know, just gave him a, a level of comfort or, or made him feel as though the Leafs were the right team for him. And, you know, it's interesting for Quinnipiac, right? That they've, they've seen a couple players now leave. Uh, Colin Graff, his, his line mate was probably the biggest NCAA free agent of this class. If you, if you can call it that. And, and, you know, I know in the past there's sort of criticism of hyping these free agents up too much. I mean, a lot of these players become real players. It's just, it's, it's on a certain timeline. I mean, Trevor Moore was one the Leafs signed years ago, ends up, you know, going to LA and now pretty effective player for the Kings. Um, and, and you can go down the list in terms of other guys, you know, Graf, interesting. He ends up in San Jose. There was some feeling he wanted to be on the East coast. He had 26 teams uh, initially that expressed some degree of interest. He, he cut it down to six. And ultimately chose the Sharks, I think, for reasons that might be apparent. Um, you know, he's going to be able to play NHL games before the end of the season. That burns off the first year of that entry-level deal. And he's on an organization that needs youth. And and I know they've made some draft picks. They got Will Smith last year in the draft and others. Uh, but, you know, the Sharks, are, the Sharks are for the future. And I think there's going to be an opportunity for him to play there. And so every player has to, I think, kind of map this out. Um but when it comes to Quillen in Toronto, you know, he's he's joined the Marlies now. He flew up this week. And and I think the Leafs, you know, we, we've seen them trade away all their draft picks the last number of years. If you've watched if you've watched the last few trade deadlines, the Leafs don't have a lot of picks left. So these are the kind of players they need to add to sort of fill in around the margins. I think we're talking about a ceiling likely of a bottom six kind of player at the NHL level. And and you know, it it, it was important enough to them. I think it says something that that Tree Living and Shanahan were were involved in the the recruitment there and ultimately got that done. And so Quinnipiac uh, has lost some, some trusted veterans here, but you know, I, I love the NCAA free agent period. It's, it's a pretty unique thing. And as I say, sometimes these are draft picks themselves are lottery tickets. I think signing a, an actual player at 21 or 22 years old is a little bit more than that. It doesn't mean it's a guarantee of course, but, um, you know, these players have had a lot of success at the NCAA level and they're, they're going to be playing pro games here by the end of the week. Okay. Uh, you, we were talking about goal scorers earlier and, uh, you happen to have written a pretty great story about one Alexander Ovechkin, Alexander Ovechkin's last stand, how a Dubai trip and a new stick revived a record pursuit in the caps season. Uh, you can read that at the athletic. Can you take us through that story? Uh, what was the inspiration behind it? And uh, just give us some finer points from it. Well, there's a reason I don't write headlines. I wouldn't even know how to write that headline, but uh, they, they did a nice job selling that. I mean, you know, I think it was... You don't one... write headlines? So like, wait, 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 wait. So do you like submit articles like with no headline and it's on the editor to do that? Oh yeah, I've never written a headline in my life. Oh, if I was your editor, I would hate you so much. So much. Really? Yes. It's so hard to come up with headlines. Oh my God. I don't even know how to, I'm like, sorry, you you know my tech. Sorry, we'll get to the story in right. a second, but but you, you know, know my level of sort of like I'm basically a luddite, but I barely know how to file the story at, at the athletic. I wouldn't know how to put a headline on it. I mean, that's. Do you not like use the CMS? Do you not use the the what we use to upload the article? Like I know you write on Docs, and then like do you not like copy paste it into? How do you do your job? <laughs> I think the the best answer is Jake <laughs> Leonard. He's my editor. He's an awesome guy, Jake. So everything Jake I Leonard. don't know. Stick tap to Jake Leonard. I was going to say everything I don't know. Jake knows. Like I write stories, and then he, somehow they become on the athletic, and that's all him. 
Okay, talk to us. Talk to us more about this story. <laughs> talk to us more about the story. I don't want. I don't know if you want to go into more detail about how you write. Is that bad? I'm sorry, I asked that quick. No, I don't think that's bad. It's just like, eh, I I don't know. I've never, I don't. I, I, don't I will what, say I this say though. That. I'm pretty veteran in the industry. I've never written a headline anywhere. Really? No. Like I've I've just been so used to like trying to come up with my own, and then at least someone tries to switch it around. I thought that the. It sounds weird. So this is the old newspaper mindset, but it's sort of yes. the the writer has an idea for his or her story and files it. And then the editors can see the whole picture and can maybe like they can figure out a better way to sell the story. Like I think the idea actually in all seriousness was just about different ways of viewing and selling the copy. Um, but yeah, for sure. And maybe this is just different school, but like I've been an editor before and it's been ingrained. I'm in just me wondering, is Jake hate me? No, Jake probably does. Should no, I, no one hates should you. Should I send no him like hates you. flowers or something? I, I mean, you can, if Case you want, beer? I mean, like you should be like, dude, me. you wrote my headlines all year. Say that for me Cause I know how hard it is to come up with headlines. And I, and I say, hate you as in like, I don't hate anybody, but no, like, I know I say that in jest. Like, I'd be like, oh, that's annoying. I got to come up with a headline. If I'm, like, taking your article and it's, like, first thing in the morning and I'm still trying to get my brain to wake up and I'm like, oh, crap. I got to read through this story and make sure I get a good headline out of it. Yeah. You have to read through it. You have to understand it. You have to correct mistakes. You may have to move some parts around if you don't think the structure is good. And then you have to figure out how to package it. Yeah, exactly. Like, like that's what you should be doing anyway. It's just that's an extra step. Like, if you, if you, if the headline is there and you just have to tweak it, that's a whole different thing compared to coming up with an entirely unique headline on your own. Well, I'll say anyway, this. I got hired. We're belaboring the point. I got hired on October 16th by the athletic. The season had yes. already started. There was no training. Yes. They're just like, okay, now you work here, do things. So there's maybe, maybe there'll be an opportunity this off season, <laughs> you know? And so I did things. I went out and reported news and I wrote stories and I did some features and presented ideas, but maybe along the way, there's some, like I barely know how to file expenses, you know. Like I, like it's, it's. Yo, <laughs> I sorry, but, but I'm just saying, like there might be a few things that that I need to like brush up on this summer, and maybe headline writing is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Well, uh, now you know some of the. I don't know. Everyone's you worked somewhere, man. Like it's hard. Everyone works places. I've worked everywhere. Yes. There's so I've many worked a lot of places. There's so many and we appreciate you. There's so many different ways things are done. <laughs> it's hard. It, it's true. It's really hard. It really is hard. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to jest. I'm saying this I mean, I jest. went to the dentist this week. They're like, where do we bill this? I'm like, oh God, I gotta figure that out again. <laughs> oh, man. Well, you know what? I feel better as as a as a younger adult learning how to adult. Yeah, that even if you get older and you have these gray whiskers in your beard, oh, yeah. there's still a lot you don't know. One day I'm gonna dye these. Like maybe season four of the pod, I come back with like jet black dyed whiskers. Make sure you use just for men, or or <laughs> would you use that? Like I I don't know if you ever used that stuff before. No, do you know what's funny? When I worked at Sportsnet, so this is going back a few years, there was some yes. discussion. There was some level of discussion, not initiated by me, about me maybe yes. dying like the beard and stuff, and I was like. I don't want to be responsible for this. Like, well, but think about it. My job there, seriously, like, and I'll say this, like, in all, this is all truth. My job there was to, like, come up with news, to come up with information. Like, I had to work hard to do that. It was not my job to figure out how to, like, make the just for men go through my beard properly. And, like, and, and since. Sorry, this should be so funny. <laughs> it's, so my view is, like, okay, I'm not the one initiating maybe dyeing my beard. Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go so ahead, go ahead. If go you ahead. guys I'm want me laughing. to do this, <laughs> like you have to, I don't know, send someone to my house or I'll go some, like I'm not doing it. So the, said the hired goods. So it died. It died. There was a brief discussion about dyeing the beard and it never happened. I've never, I've literally never okay. put hair dye in my hair. You don't need it. You don't need it. Well, I think the way that it is, 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 is fine. It's okay. You don't need hair dye. It's weird though. My, weird, I mentioned the dentist. My dental hygienist is like, "Have you ever thought about like shaving your your face clean again?" I was like, "No, no." It'd be well because it'd be weird to look at yourself. Yeah, I'm several Seriously. years in on the beard. Like it's, it's a good look. You should keep the keep the beard. I wouldn't do anything to it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 
So Alex Ovechkin. Uh, so you're Ovechkin. Story. He scored yes. eight goals in his first 43 games, and a few people in the hockey world noticed. Um, and he scored then 17 in a 23 game stretch after that fact. And so, um, someone, you know, I was assigned the idea of what happened there and tried to dig into it as best I can. I mean, not, not the most introspective individual in the league, I would say. So it's, it's hard to sort of get to the heart of the matter, but the man went to Dubai on his bye week, which is, I don't think a lot of players went to Dubai. Yeah, you don't hear a lot of guys say that they go to Dubai. I sorry, I this isn't. I'm not throwing shade at Dubai. It's just that it's eight time zones from Washington, uh, yeah. and it's a long flight. <laughs> and it, you know, it was a nine day break. But when you can, you probably lost two days of flying, more or less, like going out there and coming back. Uh, Do you still at least get a week to hang out? Right, and he rode camels with his kids in the desert. Uh, he was chilling with Wayne Rooney at one point, former soccer star yes. from Europe. Yes, former Man United superstar, DC United player. I think he managed DC United. Yeah, I think too. I think it was a good reset, honestly. In all seriousness, like the best I can tell is he went through a stretch he's never gone through his entire career. This this break comes. He scored a goal actually the last game before the break in Dallas. It's a six on five goal. It's kind of like a soft shot by his standards from the point that goes through a bunch of bodies and gets a goal. It's like, so like some good vibes return, goes to Dubai, (laughs) chills with his family, gets some sunshine, does all that stuff, comes back and he scores in the first five goals after first five games, rather after the break. And, you know, I think he, he, it it lifted a weight off his shoulders. You know, there's, there's a lot in that this could be right. Like it just a reminder that you could score the second most goals in NHL history but confidence still matters. And like, there, there's an idea that sort of maybe the momentum of your season, things that are going on, you know, Spencer Carberry mentioned that he hit six crossbars in, in the first, you know, stretch of this, the year he's had a couple goals called back. I know by offside reviews or goal, goaltender inter- interference reviews. So like some of those things don't go your way. He went through five sticks too, though. Like it does show that, that he was wrestling with something and, and, briefly 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 there was a window there where you're like is he going to break the goal scoring record i don't think anyone's asked that question anymore i mean it's not a it's not a slam dunk he goes into the game tonight against pittsburgh which will already be played by the time you hear this but but just bear with us 46 yes. goals from gretzky so you know you figure he gets a couple more this season can he get 20 to 30 next year he's got one more year beyond that like it feels like it, something in the 25 26 season that we'll be focused on but um no i i think at this point if if he's able to wake up and get it down to like 40 at the ver- I, I i think they try to make it work next year that would be something that would be something it absolutely would and keep in I, mind I, like I, he's 38 yeah. he had was it 42 and 50 goals the last two years? Like, like he scored 92 goals in the last two seasons and, and he's going to get 30 plus this year. Like most likely it, you know, we haven't, it's hard to have that kind of longevity. So yeah, that was the impetus for the story was, uh, you know, it, it was a strange time that, that he, if you look across his whole career, any 43 game stretch, the lo- the fewest goals he ever had was 12. And and you might say eight doesn't sound that different, but like that's pretty different. Like that's that's twenty. That's a sizable amount difference. And I don't. He'd never struggled like that before. And and when you get to his age, and you know he's lost, you know Kuznetsov obviously Backstrom stepped away earlier this season. Like I think there was fair reason to wonder if this this goal chase was off. And not only is the goal chase back on, but you know the Capitals might make the playoffs, which is partially their division, right? Between them, the Penguins, you know, the Devils had a tough year. The Flyers, like, like nobody's really grabbed that third spot in the Metro. It's been a, it's been a soft year in that division. But uh, if Ovechkin gets back to the playoffs in a year where they lost the two cornerstone guys I mentioned, they traded Anthony Mantha at the deadline. They traded Joel Edmondson. Like they're having their cake and eating it too. If if that's what happens, so I'm pumped when we finish recording this pod to go watch their game tonight. Because uh, I think that Capitals Penguins game is going to feel like old times. It's going to remind me of a day when I didn't have the gray in the beard, Julian. When you just had, were clean shaven, CJ. Clean shaven, didn't know shit from shit, and uh, 
Look at you now. You know more shit. Yeah, I still, I still know. Now I just know I don't know anything. No, oh, come on. You, you, you. At, at the very least, just, just learn how to file a story. Uh, just, just do that. Well, I know how to file a story. Like my stories. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. My stories exist. Your stories clearly exist. I'm just kidding. Um, we should stay in the metro though, uh, because there was a uh, a wild brawl on uh, Wednesday night where uh, Matt Rempe, of course, at the center of it, you see him fighting with Curtis. How are we just getting to this now? I know there were so many things we were. I mean, I took I think us on seventeen tangents, goals. and I just was like, I'm not going to let Julian bring this up. Yeah, <laughs> you're just like we're, we're not going to talk about fighting. We're not going to talk about that at all. Yeah, no. Uh, Matt Rampey and uh, the Curtis McDermott fight. Of course, there were eight other players ejected from that uh, that brawl between the Rangers and the Devils two seconds into that game. What did you think of the brawl? What do you think of these kind of stage fights? I think if this was happening even once a month, it would be too much. I mean, when did this last happen? Like, that's that's my view of it. This is two teams in the same marketplace that have had some pretty significant history this year with, with hits and suspensions and non-fights. You know, you'll remember Rempe was not allowed to fight in the last game. Peter Laviolette did not yes. allow him to fight in the last game against New Jersey. Um, you know, so this was building in this case and you know, it, it, it happened. Eight guys are thrown out of the game immediately. So like this, to me, I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel. I don't think that this requires a hot take. It was pretty damn entertaining. Um, and I don't think, I don't think this is a, this is not a pandemic of fights off the face off or, you know, it's, it was genuine, true emotion. I don't necessarily, in general, I don't love a stage fight, but that it's hard not to say that wasn't, that wasn't, that was good for business. Like, Okay, um, you might not agree. No, like I, I, this... I don't, I don't know where I stand on it. I, I, like I don't know if I disagree. I just don't know how I feel about fighting because there's the one side where I look at it and I get the arguments about how archaic it is and the fact that these fights are staged and it's just like we don't need this. Like we need, like we have a game with all these great players that are super skilled and super amazing, and we should be hyping that up. Were you not excited? Just some... That gets to the other side of this. There's something about fighting that even if you don't like it, you you can't help but watch. You can't help but feel some kind of jolt and wildness. Like like there's something about the the act of doing it that's still invigorating in a sense. So genuinely, like I don't know how to feel about it. Like I, I'm not I'm not trying to be contrarian. I'm not trying to go against it. I genuinely don't know how to feel about that in our sport. And there, there are players in the league like a Ryan Reeves or a Max Domi who will argue about how we still need fighting in the sport. Just like there are people on the other side who will say we don't. I don't know where to go. I really don't. I guess it shows the players care though. Like at the base level. Yeah. It shows that those guys started that game. There was there was beef it wasn't media created. It was real. Rempe had, had thrown in the previous two games, two very questionable hits, one of which he got a four game suspension for. They, they wanted him to answer for that with a fight in the previous game in which his bench clearly told him not to do. And the players showed up caring. Like I, I that's, that's where it's, is that for me? Like I'm with you. Like we all know about the effects of CTE and I'm not, I'm really not dismissing that. No, absolutely not. Like I'm not trying to, to like brush this by discussion that. too. But no. But I don't know. You also get one life to live. Like this is this is like seriously a fine line. I'm there's probably half the people listening to this podcast are like CJ, you're a freaking idiot. But you get one life to live. It's not going to be perfect. You're not going to eat your greens every day. You're not going to only have water and whatever. You're, like you got to live. And like that game, like those guys yeah, but were living. People would say the opposite too. They would say you have one life to live. You have one brain. You shouldn't be taking this much trauma and, and contact to the head. It was exciting. Sure. It was awesome. I think that's, and that's okay to say. Seriously, and I don't, I'm not, I know here, I'm a barbarian. I'm, I'm, I'm not awesome. here to judge. I'm not here to sit here and say, I don't need to see a fight in every game. I don't need to see the fake shit, but like, that was awesome. Like those two teams, they cared those guys, like no one made them do it. I don't know. And, and look at again, eight players ejected 
right off the start of the game. So it didn't lead. I know there was one more fight in the game after that, but like there wasn't, it wasn't like, it wasn't the seventies all over again, where like the same group of players went out and fought and fought and fought. Like I do think, and also seriously, dude, we're talking about things we might not never see again. Like, I don't know. What are we going to see a five on five fight off the top of the, the game? It could seriously, it might never happen again. Like it's that, it could be that rare. It's pretty rare already. And so yeah. my reaction was, I saw that and I was like, let's go. But I'll say this, like I, when chaos happens in the NHL, like we all, we all want to see it. We all, it's, it's, it's out of the ordinary. So like, and I it's root for chaos. Do you know what it is? It's so it's, it's conflicting for me. Hockey isn't just a game we watch. It's a game we feel. And yeah, when you see that happen again, like I know I'm not saying like, I'm not, you, you know, look at me. I'm not a fighter. I would stand no chance in any fight. If anyone wants to go at me, you're going to win. I, I'll, I'll, I'll like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think you're, I think you're underestimating. Yourself. But I'm, but, I, but my point is, is this is I, I didn't grow up a fighter. I'm not pretending to be a fighter, but like, you know, I, I'm a passionate person and I just see the passion in the sport. And I, and I see some passion in that. Again, because it doesn't happen every night. It's not just like everyone's going through the motions. Like, I don't even know how the hell that happened. But those guys cared anyway. So, no, I don't no, want please, to spend time shouting like, anyone I, down. I just, but I, I do think, no. I'll tell you, I was pretty fascinated. I was at the Leafs game, but I was like, I heard about this. I was like, I need to know more about this. And I watched every video. Like, I'm hoping John Boy comes out with the coaches yelling at each other. Like, I want the whole thing. Yeah. I want the whole thing. Yeah, I got, that's true. I'm still willing to digest more content on that, John Boy, if you want to get on that. So, so is it that is that like the future of, of fighting in this sport? Like, like we keep thinking that like it's going to die, but it seems as if because of how rare when it happens, people get excited about it. Is is it still just going to hang around? Like, I'm genuinely curious about it because I thought it was going to die. I think and it will die eventually. Rent- but it will with, with the way that we've banned it in different junior leagues. But the way guys like Matt, Rem- Matt Rempe are literally building their names off of fighting kind of suggests that at the very least, there's a section of people who want it to still see it thrive. And at the very least, like it will attract eyeballs to that. Like you go on the athletic and you see the engagement on those stories whenever he fights. It's crazy over there. Don't don't Google this. How many NHL games do you think Matt Rempe has played? Don't Google this. Yeah, like don't. I'm just, I'm just testing you because I think I'm going to make a point. Whatever you guess. Ten. You're a bit light. He's eighteen, but I, I still think it's okay. amazing though. Like how much we've talked about him on our podcast. How many times the guy's played eighteen games? He's got sixty nine career penalty minutes. Nice. And. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying it's wild. Like how much we've discussed him, like other than Connor oh, Bedard, you're right. But how, like, I, like I'm just saying, we probably talked about Connor Bedard more than Rempe before he got the 18 games. But like almost nobody. No, but to your point, it, but you bring up a really good point though, because we've talked about Connor Bedard a lot. We've talked about Matt Rempe a lot. Have we mentioned Brock Faber? No, we haven't mentioned <laughs> Brock Faber. That was a, that was, we have That was a design pause, by the way. It was not that I. No, yeah, absolutely. That's it. That played to my point. You, you're. I'm, I'm speaking to your point, but like. The fighting, like it's it's a talking point. It's no shade to Brock Faber, who will probably come in second to Connor Bedard in the rookie chase, but he's really good. But for whatever reason, he hasn't captured our attention the same way that Matt Rempe has or Connor Bedard. I mean, it's entertainment at the end of the day, pure and yeah, simple. I, I, and and I look, at, I'm not telling everyone to go out and be entertained by fight. Like like seriously, I'm I I've said this before. I, I'm split on this, but I if I'm just gonna be honest. I've always tried to be so honest on this podcast, man. Like I don't dress anything up. When I found out about that fight last night, I could not find enough clips of it. I could not read enough about it. I could not, I I am still interested in it. And anyway, I'm a barbarian. If I mean, I, I wouldn't classify you as that because I think inherently we all as hockey fans still have that where if we see that we're going to get attracted to it. We're going to see it. I mean, I, again, I'm split. I don't know where I really should stand on this, but like, I'm just not, I'm not, I mean, especially maybe it's a little difficult for us as journalists, as media people, but we're not going to ignore it. Well, let's just make the, like hockey is still fun, man. It is a great game. It's just, 
we have to have we have to ask the questions if fighting is part of that fun. But maybe that's maybe that's for a fighting. Well, seriously, and for I, I'm not episode. I'm being legit about this. If we came back and did a show in two weeks' time, and we've seen three more of those fights off the the opening face off, I'd probably have a totally different take. It's just sure. it's the fact that it's so unusual that it's so unique that I don't think it will repeat it. That I don't think it's I don't think it's an epidemic. I don't think it's a problem. I think it's emblematic mm-hmm. of one specific situation. I think it's a lot of people that really care about their teams and the moment and the sport and what's going on. That's why I liked it. That's that's all. True. Again, I don't want. Yeah. I don't need to see it every night. I don't think hockey needs it to sell the sport. But when it happens, you're like, let's go. Holy shit! Let's go. Like, yeah. Okay. I I I like your take on it. I'm I mean, alienating the hundred percenters here, though. No, I, I mean like they're they're. I think fighting is a genuine debate where people can have civil discussion about it, and people will continue to have civil discussion about it. I guess there's a lot of nuance uh, to this stuff, is what I'm getting at. Like, there absolutely is. We all feel this. Like we're like, I know I shouldn't want it like this, but I do. I shouldn't want to have that ice cream, but man, that vanilla is so tasty. Damn, I might have ice cream after this. Oh yeah, do you have ice cream at your house? I have uh, a bucket of Briar's vanilla. I have those like Hagen Dazs uh, ice strawberry ice cream chocolate covered bars. <laughs> you and I are animals. We like talk about work, and then we just the whenever we go to anything else, it's like you and I talk about food. <laughs> it's like <laughs> hockey or food are this the only it. two acceptable topics. I when I finish this after I have ice cream, I'm going to fry some uh, chicken tenders I seasoned and uh, breaded last night. Oh wow! For dinner. Chicken yeah. tenders and ice cream. Like, you are living your best life. <laughs> That's not my exact dinner. I'm going to have, like, other stuff with it. Hey. I'm not going to just... I'm not, a, I'm not a savage just eating chicken tenders and And just watching cream. stage fights and just, like, sitting back. <laughs> you know what? Let me not do this no. for people. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Um, stick taps. Do you have a stick tap this week? You first. <laughs> okay, then I have a cross check. Whoa. Yeah, this is a I have feistier a show check. than we planned. Yeah, I think so. Um, it's not a really serious cross check, but I am. I, I I've I'm an older person now, mm-hmm. and I have grown out of April Fools. Ooh. I think April Fools' Day is a stupid holiday, and especially in our business where we're trying to ward people off from misinformation, all the more reason for it to not be a thing. What I hate especially is that our algorithms are so bad on the social media platforms that we have where we see stuff that was dropped a day or two in the past, which means this week I've had to see a bunch of April Fool's Day content days after the fact. I don't like it. I think it's stupid. And I think all of us as a society, just like how we all want to band together and not make daylight savings time a thing. I I think we should start putting that towards April Fool's Day. Like, it's a stupid, stupid concept. And I don't think we need to be doing that anymore. Yes, I understand there was a Simpsons meme I retweeted or I liked or whatever. That was that was funny at the time. But we don't need April Fool's jokes anymore. And that is my cross check. So to anyone who thinks it's a genuine holiday to be celebrated, I don't know, man. Grow up. Grow up. Okay? Grow up. It's funny. I've got that no opinions on that, week. plus or negative, but I appreciate your passion. Okay. I'm going to just cross-check okay. the what Toronto Blue Jays. Like I, Yeah, that's an easy sell. <laughs> no, it's an easy sell, but I'm feeling it, man. I'm I'm going to the home Go opener off. on Go Monday, off, but I'm going to be hate-watching. Like I, I'm so conflicted. We talk about being conflicted about the fighting stuff. I'm conflicted on the Blue Jays. It's like I'm, In theory, I want them to win, but uh, they've been no hit and one hit already. Like, it's amazing. Yeah. Imagine they didn't have enough hits last year. And then you went through the offseason and you didn't go get a hitter. Like, what? What? Like, Justin Turner's the best thing you could hey, think of? I like him because he's got old guy energy. Okay, fine. He's like 39 years old and he's still providing a bat for the lineup. But, like, really? Anyway. Really? I still think they should have gotten Blake Snell, too. Like, really? You're going to throw out all that money for Shohei Otani, and then you get gun-shy for the rest of the offseason, you don't throw that money elsewhere? What's going on? Oh, you're throwing both Toronto? cross-checks. I love it. 
I don't know about that. This is just on top of your. Crime. I'm going to say though, if they win ten one in the opener and like hit a bunch of dingers, I'm going to be cheering and eating hot dogs and be excited. But okay, but I'm. Can we get a photo of that in the group chat when you're when you're when you're when you're in it? Yeah, Nick, producer Nick got to see the Roger Center upgrades too. I saw. That. I think He's that's where the money eat. went this up se- this off season. It's like fancier chairs and closer view from the foul line people are people are did you see the video of him like acting as if he was throwing a pitch off the oh i would have hit that thing into the upper deck (laughs) that's what people are doing people are taking the video my name is cj and i hit and i hit dinger did you see the video of the original kid who said that and he's like a high school senior now he's like trimmed down and he still hits dingers yes epic that's what i'm referencing yo my name's Big Al, and I hit dingers. Like, what a cool ass kid, man! He was a cool ass kid. Yeah, I'd love to hit a dinger. Me too. That might actually be if, like, you know, that question, like, if could you catch a touchdown or score a goal? I think hitting a home run in baseball might be like the one athletic achievement I'm not capable of doing. But if I could choose to do one, might be it. You don't play like slow pitch or anything with like. No. You don't do that. Would you do that? No. Why not? I don't know. I want to like go to a cottage or chill in Europe or I don't know. Like, I mean, you could, you could just like take a week off and do that. And then like go back into the city. And, but like, I'm talking play. about in the know. major leagues. Like I would love to hit a dinger. Like you just hit one off the green monster. And then you get Fenway that surge Park. of emotion and then you get the slow trot around the bases. Like that's pretty cool. That is a pretty good feeling. Like, I mean, it's one thing to just do it in a game, but like bottom of the ninth game winning moon rocket out of the building. How about bottom of the seventh after the the uh, ums were jobbing you in a must win game? And then you might flip a bat and that would have people debate for weeks about whether you should flip a bat. Like, I want to I want to hit a dinger and flip a bat. Dude, that we could do an entire new episode about the Jose Bautista bat flip. That is still one of the greatest sport moments to have ever happened ever. And I was there. I'm jealous of you. I was in a university class as it was happening. Ooh, tough balance, but now you're out of university. Uh, Look at the bright side. You're never going to be stuck in a university class for another sports moment. Again, you can just, you can just go to these games and get paid and write about it and talk about it. Like it's, it's beautiful thing. Or just go to games and just hang out and just be like, yeah, man, this is so cool. I love it. And that's why it's important for us to, that's why I'm glad we still have that joie de vivre when it comes to sports. We're not uh, jaded from it. No. Anyway, uh, Monday, we'll be back. Get your questions in on Twitter, on Discord. Subscribe to the podcast. And uh, if you love sports, keep that love alive. Sports are fun. You never know where it will take you. Sports are supposed to be fun. That's what the STP taught us. For CJ. Me. Yes. The STP taught us well. For CJ, I'm Julian. Peace, guys. The Chris Johnston Show. Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at ReporterChris. And follow Julian McKenzie at JK McKenzie.